thanks, O oh God, for not abandoning us in our need, but supplying us with everything we need to live as your people. We offer up to you today the concerns and the cares of our hearts and our minds, those things which we carry with us that you know, Lord, as we consider our family, our communities, our friends, and our neighbors. We are mindful ever of those who continue to suffer at the hands of this pandemic. We continue to pray for our first responders and those who are doctors and nurses and all those involved in the medical field, Lord, who offer themselves in a way to provide healing to others. We pray for them, and we pray for those who are continuing to battle illness. Let a healing touch come from you, O oh God, and give them the peace and the comfort they desire. We pray for our elected officials and those who were appointed to serve and to govern. Father, we pray that your spirit would lead and guide them in making decisions that are beneficial for all people, equitable and justice. Father, we pray for them, and we ask your hand be upon them. We survey our communities, O oh Lord, and we know there are many who are in need, many who continue to suffer. And Father, we pray that you would use us as your emissaries of love, as your hands and feet, to go out to comfort the afflicted, to offer compassion to those who are hurting, to visit those in prison, to offer water to the thirsty, food to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and Father, to visit and tend to those who are sick. Use us, O oh God, as your people, that we might be found faithful just as you are faithful. And Father, we ask now that as we gather in this space for worship, and we prepare to read the scriptures and prepare to continue singing our hymns of praise and offering our prayers, that your spirit would rest with us. Give us the peace we desire. Enable us to know you more and to be drawn ever closer to you. Bless our time of worship, Lord, and be with us now. In Jesus Christ, our Lord's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> This morning as we are gathered together, we're going to be reading a few verses here that are going to enable us to uh, see that Jesus is coming into the last moments of his earthly ministry. He is working toward Jerusalem. Uh, he is making his way toward the cross. This season of Lent calls us to ponder and meditate upon the cross that Christ bears on our behalf. And at that same cross, which will be, lead to the culmination of his earthly ministry. This morning we're going to read a small snippet of this as Jesus foreshadows his own death, but gives within it great hope. Oftentimes we look to the cross, we look to places where this takes place, and it can lead us into a dark place, a place where we feel hopeless. But Jesus always, always names that in all ways and in all places and in all things, God always has and gets the final word. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, all honor and glory be to you. We give thanks for the gift of these here holy scriptures as you have gifted them to us. We give thanks for those who have come long before us and written these words down in order that they might be passed on from person to person, compiled together in this book, Father, find a way in our own language in front of our very eyes. How fortunate we are, oh God, to have these words. And we pray now that your spirit would help us in interpreting them. Father, help us to move beyond just simple knowledge of who you are and what you're doing. But Father, that these words would take root in our hearts and we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Be with us now, God. Speak to us your words of wisdom and truth. And let the words of our own mouths and the meditations of our own hearts be pleasing in your sight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our passage this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. John. We're going to be in chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 20 through 33. You stand with me as you are ready to hear the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
Now among them, those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to them. Jesus answered, The voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let me see. We're reminded that as God walks in and amongst us in the person of Jesus Christ, he does so with compassion and with humility and in some of the most unassuming places. Jesus is not from Jerusalem. We want to name that today. He's from the Galilean region. He's from Nazareth. Nazareth is a small town. There's not a lot going on in Nazareth. Jesus himself would have been a very rural-minded person. And in his day and time, he would have come from a very agrarian society. Many people, all people just about, were involved in some sort of day-to-day -day cultivation, growing, tending to their own crops, their own gardens, as well as those who uh, farmed on bigger scales in order to feed the whole community. He uses a lot of imagery in order to connect with his own countrymen, the people he knows, the people he's grown up around, in order to make analogies out of simple things that most people understand. It's one of the great gifts of God that Jesus shows up in our midst, not to talk over our heads, but to connect with us right where we are. We know in our own day and time, right now, it's getting to be planting season, and as I have talked with some other people around, people get kind of grumpy. They're ready to get the ground tilled up and get their vegetable garden in. My great-grandmother used to grow a marvelous vegetable garden every year, and she would invite all of us to come to her house and do what? Pick it for, right? Wasn't that nice? And we'd get out there, and we'd have our big five-gallon buckets, and we'd start pulling vegetables and, and breaking things off and putting them in the bucket. And we'd bring it in, and she'd say, oh, this is what I'm going to do. And she'd separate everything out on the counter, wash everything, uh, and then go about making her mind toward what she was going to can, what she was going to eat, what was going to stay fresh. And it always turned out that there was way more than she could ever eat. It was always her word. Oh, no, you take that with you. And we say, but don't you want this? You grew all this in. She goes, oh no, I want you to have it. This is one of the fun things about our family is growing our own food in some ways, but then always having enough to share with each other. The amount of fruit yield, the amount of time put in and care into growing those fruits and vegetables always provided more than enough for the nourishment of many beyond yourself. We might consider the analogy that Jesus uses today to indicate the time of death that he is going to die. We know in the previous passages 
Peter stands in front of Jesus and says, no, 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 you are not going there. And we won't let anything bad happen to you. And Jesus takes Peter and shoves him to the side and says, no, this is why I'm here. God has sent me on a trajectory that will lead to the cross. The world will have no other way with the presence of God in its midst. It will try to snuff it out. But Jesus is looking at the hope on the other side. Unless a single grain, he says, goes into the earth and dies, it remains but a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It's an interesting invitation, isn't it? To the Christian life. Much of our invitations often in talking about what God will do for us, deal with the blessings and deal with the fruit bearing, but the beginning piece of that is the denial of oneself in order that God might put to death one thing and raise to life a new thing. Maybe you remember sitting in seventh grade science class and they told you all about how things grow. So the most boring lessons I've ever sat through. For some people it may be fascinating, but it's very interesting, right? When we talk about germination of a seed and planting it in the ground, there have to be several things that are right. I have brown thumb, and I am not good at growing anything. I try desperately to grow things. I'm not good at it. I wish I was. My family can do it. They grow big vegetable gardens. We try to do it in our house. I have to fight the deer. I have to fight the raccoons. I have to fight me, mostly, to get something to come up out of the ground. But when we talk about germination of a seed, right, there have to be some things that are correct. Some of you may follow the old farmer's almanac before you plant your spring garden, and we want the moon to be right, and the wind to be right, and we want all of the frost to be over with so that it won't kill anything, because the ground needs to be a little bit warm, and it needs to be a little bit damp, and if the temperature gets right and the humidity is right in that soil, well then that little seed that you put in the ground will do what? It'll crack open. And out of that seed will begin to grow a little green shoot, a little small little green shoot. And then that little green shoot will pop up through the top layer of the soil. And then it'll break off with some leaves. And then if you're lucky, a deer won't come by and bite that. And if that doesn't happen, then it will continue to grow. And once it grows, it will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it begins to yield a whole bunch of okra or many ears of corn. And from those things, many will be fed and nourished. It's fascinating what our God has set into motion that these things occur seasonally, year after year after year. And you and I are beneficiaries of something we have not designed, we have not created. None of us put into motion the way seeds work and how the ground will yield for us what will save us and feed us. But yet by God's own providence and love and care for the world and for the people, there's always enough, and sometimes far beyond, to feed those in far reaches of our communities, far reaches of the world. But when Jesus talks to us about the beginning stages of that seed, he's indicating to us that a change must take place. It is central to the Christian life and journey that change and transformation be worked out through the moving of the Spirit of God within us. We cannot show up to God and remain the same. We cannot envision or be a part of a connectional relationship with God and continue to be who we are today. It's impossible. The very nature of God is to transform, to regenerate, to cultivate and to grow. And God is calling each and every one of us to submit ourselves 
as we reside in this season of Lent, we're doing so because we're following a Lord that gives himself over for the purposes and the will of the Father. It is Jesus who we know already in the rest of the story. We'll go to the cross, we'll die, we'll be in the grave for three days, but God will bring him back. And in doing so, he will defeat the powers of sin and death, and nothing will hold us captive any longer. And it's St. Paul who reminds us, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. God is calling each and every one of us to walk in a journey down a road, down a path, that takes us to a place of ultimate humility, to be planted in whatever garden our God is growing, to lay ourselves bare, to be present before His Spirit, in order that we might die to ourselves and be born again as children and heirs of the kingdom. But just like that seed, there will be some cracking, some splitting. It is a painful process. It is not easily entered into. But the hope that Jesus gives us is that it is a payoff on the other side of our submission and humility to lay ourselves bare before God, that God will take us far beyond anything we can imagine or dream or cultivate ourselves. For it is God who defeats those powers. It is God who makes a way when there is no way. It is God who calls us to places of suffering and challenge and hardship only to break us through to the other side. The places where life is had and it's had abundantly. My prayer for you in this gardening season and a prayer for myself is that like that seed we would be amenable to the master gardener to plant us where we ought to be planted, to do with us as he sees fit, to tend to us, fertilize us, to water us, to feed us, that we might grow into everything God has planned for us to be. May it be so in this season of life. And may that spirit give us the courage to be a seed in the hand of God. Trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into 
take temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Closing in this morning is going to be hymn number 374. As we consider that Christ is calling us into uncharted territory, and inviting us into places where we might be very unsure. We can trust the promises that God will see us through and take us to his eternal kingdom. Let us stand together and sing all four verses of number 374, Standing in the Promises. Send you forward now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 